One, two, one, two, you know how we do. It's your boy, BQ, and this is the B-Side Podcast for the Impact Lounge. Thank you so much for being here, as always. If you're if you're listening on YouTube right now, I know I've been getting messages about where is the original YouTube content and everything. There was a, you know, obviously a period of time of a couple of years where I was damn near doing content every single day on the channel, and... I'll probably never get back to that point again, but uh, I do hear you, and I'm going to try to get back on, uh, you know, back on the saddle and provide some more of that right now. Uh, in a couple months from now, I'm going to be changing up my work schedule, and and right now my work schedule mix with with life, you know, they they it's they don't mix at all, and uh, the free time that I have to accomplish anything is very very minimal so i'm hoping when i get a a new work schedule here soon that it's um a little friendlier to some of the ventures that you know i like to do outside of work outside of family and uh i have about six weeks coming up the end of march i'll be out of town for uh some military stuff and um it'll just be me in my hotel room and uh you know, it'll be six, <laughs> six weeks without my kids and with, uh, you know, just other distractions I have when I'm at home. So, uh, for that period of time, I'm hoping to really do a lot, uh, pot, a lot of podcasting, a lot of, uh, content because it does hurt the channel when I'm able not to, you know, not able to do a whole lot, but we added the shooting up North podcast with Lewis Carlin and he's been really excited about, uh, the feedback and, uh, the, engagement with the fans on the on the youtube channel so he's been really enjoying that and um got another podcast coming soon he's just kind of getting his bearing got some things going on too but we got more coming but as far as the the original content it is coming and uh i'm gonna at least be doing discussion questions if anything because those aren't too difficult to do so uh let's talk chris chris bay real quick um i know uh Lewis talked about on his podcast that we just uploaded as well. This uh, this signing obviously is a great signing. I think it kind of hit us out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, he appeared on Impact a few months ago for uh, before Bound for Glory. They were doing the qualifying matches for the ladder match at BFG. And he was just kind of randomly inserted in there. No, <laughs> no build up, no, uh, no anything. He was just kind of there. And he had a match with Daga, I believe, that was really good. And, you know, people were blowing up Impact's Twitter. Sign this guy, sign this guy. And it gets frustrating sometimes because we watch the, whether it's Impact or the, usually the Impact Plus specials, the shows on Twitch, we see new names, new stars. And people are always like, sign this guy, sign this guy, and, and, and nothing happens, you know, especially with the ladies. They, they need knockouts really badly. I'm going to be doing an uh, upload discussion question on that here really soon. But they definitely need knockouts. And we've seen a couple the last the last, uh, the last couple shows on, on Twitch and everything that you would think just would be good additions to the roster, and they just don't. They don't do anything, you know. We we get the Larry D's and the AC Romeros, and as talented as they are, and, and Larry D is good, folks. Uh, those matches he put on last weekend were were, were excellent when he was te- when he was teaming with AC Romero. But as far as the people that the fans want, we're not getting that. You know what I mean? They're they're signing who they want, basically. <laughs> so this was one of those ones that you just felt was gonna. You know, they were going to pull a Shotzi Blackheart. It's just going to slip through their fingertips and, you know, end up on whatever other show and, you know, get this social media following. And they, oh, this guy's so amazing. You know, this guy has real potential to be a big player in the X division and, and maybe beyond. You know, we, we never know what impact has plans, planned for someone. But it's really cool because they're actually, you know, announce they, you know, they announced the signing on television and they're making a big deal about it. And that's good marketing because it makes us, 
and get excited, you know, as opposed to the Balfour Glory match where he just showed up out of nowhere. You know, now we're getting some kind of, you know, build behind him coming to the company. So it's a excellent signing. And I made a comment. It might have been another podcast or on YouTube or whatever. But I made a comment that I don't think Impact's going to make a signing bigger than Michael Elgin in 2020. I think. And I, I stand by that. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But Michael Elgin's still a bigger signing than what Chris Bay is when you're talking name value. But from a talent standpoint, this signing is it has exceeded my expectations of anyone I thought they would bring on this year. But... I still stand by that. I think they're going to have a hard time being a, pr- a player in free agency. And a lot of that is because this is another separate upload I'm going to be doing as well. But, you know, they're making enemies with everybody. And they were the ones who were like, you know, collaboration, not competition. And they're the ones on the outside looking in. You know, you see ROH partnering with N- NWA. Um, and that could actually open the door to something with AEW. And then AEW's got something going on with AAA. And Impact is now pissed at AAA for that. And Noah's working with MLW. And Impact's pissed at Noah for that. And, you know, ROH doesn't want to work with Impact. And NWA doesn't. MLW doesn't. You know, for a long time, Lucha Underground didn't. Uh, obviously, Lucha Underground's not around anymore. But it just seems like, you know, no one really wants to work with them. So, uh the opportunity is not, you know, like with Jeff Cobb, I know he had interest in signing with Impact once upon a time, but, you know, they have such a poor job, poor uh, working relationship with New Japan, and that's where he really wants to wrestle. I mean, a signing like that was just never possible. So um, I'm going I'm to do kind of a separate upload on all that later, kind of a discussion question with you guys, but uh, this is just an excellent signing for the roster. And it's someone the fans wanted, which is which is really cool. The uh, Impact Plus and Twitch special, special, excuse me, specials. Those have imp- improved quite a bit. And is it a coincidence? Most likely. But when I did the two podcasts, uh, I had twenty total ways to improve Twitch and Impact Plus. Uh, I would say over fifty percent of the things I said we're starting to see now. And you know, again, it's probably. A coincidence but the the specials are a lot easier to to watch now a lot easier on twitch a lot easier on impact plus you know the twitch is still you know it, it's weird that they do these twitch shows and there's 100 people 150 people in the crowd and then you do the impact plus show and it's you know it's filled up and someone brought up the other day to me said well twitch is more of a house show and impact plus they're specials they're almost like pay-per-views and that makes sense you know with how the way impact treats them it's just weird that with the twitch shows it's almost like they just want to put content up on on the twitch channel you know it's just weird to not see that dedication to the those shows you know um if you want to do it in a high school gym that's fine but why are there so few people there and then you do an Impact Plus show the next night that's in the same vicinity, same local area, and, you know, it's packed. It's, it's really weird, but the uh, the specials are much improved, much easier to watch. I mean, there was a string of months I didn't watch them. And, you know, you got to give props because Impact now with the Impact Plus specials are, are you know, building storylines on TV. And then storylines from the specials are carrying over to TV. So this is... A no-brainer and they should have been doing this a long time ago but now they're doing it and you see it with what they're doing with Tessa Blanchard and uh, Ace Austin you know they were building that main event up and then that's when Ace said well the next match needs to be a title shot you know a title opportunity and, and you know Scott Demore's like okay cool you know so title is on the line but it's your X Division Championship you know so you tie them together so that's really awesome also you know speaking of Scott Demore uh, I don't know if anyone else, I get very bothered by the, you know, the, when you're watching the show and everyone's always like impact management, man, impact management, impact management. Yet we don't know, even know who the hell impact management is on screen because, you know, every once in a while they kind of act like Don Callis is part of that. 
Um, and th- that just goes to the inconsistency of his character. And, you know, with Scott D. Moore, they kind of do that. They kind of act like he's impact management, but, but it's not clear. It's not clear cut. You know, I know authority figures are really played out, but you can have an authority figure and not take over the show. You know, you can have impact management, but put a face to impact management. And, uh, you know, Scott will do segments on the show, but it's, it's his, his role on screen is not clear cut. You know what I mean? But speaking of that, um, you know, speaking of impact management, the other thing I wanted to get into, <laughs> I talk about Don Callis a lot on commentary. On this episode of Impact, he, I think it even started in the last episode too. I mean, we had to go through eight months of him popping boners over Tessa Blanchard and, you know, she's not a the best women's wrestler. She's one of the best wrestlers you know, saying that over and over. And then all of a sudden on these episodes out of the blue, he's just like, well, you know, Ace Austin's my favorite star on the roster. And, uh, he had no problem with him trying to bang Alicia, even though he always calling OVE scumbags and vile and disgusting. And, but Ace Austin was cool. And it it was just really weird because he, he's now flip flopping on Tessa to where he's like, oh, she wouldn't last t- five minutes with Michael Elgin. So, what is it? She's one of the best wrestlers in the world, or she can't wrestle the dudes? I mean, the the inconsistency is horrendous. And you know, if I were to ever meet Don Callis, I w- you know I would shake his hand because because of him and Scott Demore Impact is still going strong, it's still on the air, and it's. It's doing good things. So when I complain about him on commentary, it doesn't mean I don't I don't like him or I don't want him part of the company. Like some people just I think are are better at certain things and and not at others. Uh, if you take my for an example, like if you take my military career, I was I was law enforcement for fourteen years on active duty, and I was good at that. And when I joined the reserves, I became a aircraft mechanic. Uh, I did that for a year and I sucked. I was horrible and I was able to get out of that to (laughs) go do another job. But I mean, I sucked. It just wasn't for me. And it does, it didn't mean that I was a bad troop, bad person. It just wasn't for me. And, uh, I'm not saying commentary is not for, for Don because there's times where he's really good, but I think he's, there's other things for him to be focused on and his unfocus on commentary really shows when he gets on TV, the way his character is just all over the place. So now he's, you know, he was damn near anti Tessa to start the show off. And then when in the main event, he treated her totally different. And I've been noticing a formula with the commentary to where the first match, they're always really good. And the main event, they're really good. And then in the middle of the show, you know, if you get like an Eddie or Elgin match, or in this case, you know, they're wrestling each other, they do really good for that. But everything around it is horrible. And I feel like I I know the formula. Like they're saying, okay, we're going to, you know, the the important matches, we're going to really go all in. And then we're going to tone it down on the others, be a little more loose, a little more, more fun. But the problem is I don't particularly find him and Josh very funny. Um, they're, you know, they're fairly well-spoken when they do commentary, but it's not everyone in this world is funny. You see that, you know, WWE for years, I'm sure they still do it, have really relied on like comedy and doing bad comedy. But the problem is not everybody is funny. That's why, you know, Eli Drake was so entertaining, still is so entertaining because he's a, a genuine funny person. And I think you see that with John Moxley a little bit too, with Chris Jericho. Um, people who are genuinely funny come across as entertaining. When you when you crack jokes, but you're not a funny person, um, they, it just comes off horrible. And that happens way too much during the show. But I've just noticed there's that little bit of formula, uh, that little formula. But um, it's ju- it's just really odd with Tessa now. You know, just months of pumping her up and. Uh, you know, refusing to go against her. 
in in any of the matches, and now all of a sudden he's uh, you know broadcasting with with doubt about her. It's really odd, and uh, you know I talked about the improved Impact Plus specials where they have D'Lo Brown on there. He's light years ahead of Don Callis as a color commentary color commentator. He's he's just so much better. It's not even funny. And I really think he should be the consistent guy because Josh is better next to him. And, you know, I don't think Impact's ever going to be able to do a full rebrand until <laughs> they replace Josh on commentary because he's always going to be a TNA. Like, that, that's that's the one TNA part of the show that's never gone away is Josh on commentary and Josh on everything, you know. I don't think they're going to be able to fully rebrand until he's gone. But, um, not gone from the company, just gone from the booth, but he's better with D'Lo, you know, he has better common, uh, chemistry with him. Just like Josh had, had really good chemistry with the Pope. Uh, you know, he had horrible chemistry with Jeremy Borash and that's probably the worst commentary we've ever heard on impact. Um, and with Don, it's, it's just hit or miss. And I don't think, you know, I, I've talked about this a lot on previous podcasts. I may even talk about it on every podcast, but Josh does a better job when he his partner is consistent with their character and their role. And Josh has to adjust to Don way too much. And it just, yeah, you know, I'm very close to watching Impact on, on mute. I mean, that's how bad it's, it's getting in my opinion. All right, let's talk the uh, actual Impact Wrestling show from this week on, I think it was on the 25th, right? So um, we're going to run through the show real quick. Uh, Daga took on RBD in the first match and, you know, the match was what it was. The story behind, you know, the storyline that they're starting to build, that was the importance of the match. Now, was it delivered on screen very well when Katie Forbes disappeared and all that? No, hell no. Uh, they could have done a much better job. I don't, I don't know if I have an idea of how they could have done it, but it's, they probably could have built it up a little bit, you know, from week to week talking about what people say about them on social media and everything. You know, I don't know that the the live crowd had a clue what was going on. And, and I've talked about before that impact has some kind of disconnect with the live crowd. And I don't know exactly what it is, but they just do. And, uh, they didn't know what was going on with Carrie, Katie Forbes and, it ended up just being a normal match, regular, regular ass match. But after the match, when Joey Ryan approached them, and I know where they're going with this because I saw a spoiler by accident, but, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to what they're doing. But I was I was intrigued once he came in the picture and said, you know, said what he said. Hey, I I relate to you guys. The you know the internet talks about me too, you know, so. We'll see the direction they go with it, but to me, uh, I think something good is is coming. Uh, Wentz took on Rohit Raju, and I was hoping this was going to be a better showcase for Rohit. They got some time, though, and he got some mic time finally. Uh, sounded really good. Um, the match was okay. Uh, I, I thought it was going to be a little bit better than it was. Uh, I was kind of looking for them to kind of hit the the next gear and there was just kind of you know too much shenanigans towards the end but it was good to see Rohit get a win and they're you know they're building the the hit squads actually win now because you know for a while they were just losing all their matches and uh, you know Raj is I think he's hurt in real life so they've got him you know he's on a spiritual journey or whatever I don't know if he's gonna come back or not but I think when it's Rohit and um, Shira, there's a lot more potential in that. And if they were to win the tag team titles, I could, I could buy it. But if, you know, Raj and Rohit were to win, I don't think that would, would get over very well. And, uh, but you know, it seems like, uh, the hit squad, the Daisy hit squad and the rascals are going to kind of feud going forward. And I think they brought Trey out for this, which was odd because wasn't he in the oh no he was in the main event the week before i'm sorry i'm uh i watched the shows back to back so i was kind of confused um so it seems like they're going to be feuding for 
a little bit. Um, OBE had a little promo backstage, which I thought was pretty funny actually when Dave was saying, you know, he was basically going to say he needs to be, he, he'll be the new leader. And Madman Fulton looked at him and he's, and the leader could be you. <laughs> real, real smooth transition, very funny. And still trying to get Dave on the podcast. Uh, just, you know, my schedule <laughs> is what makes it so difficult. Uh, he gave me a couple opportunities and I just, uh, having a hard time linking up, but, uh, that'll happen pretty soon. So Jordan Grace took on Miranda Alizé. Uh, I met her briefly at Mania weekend a couple years ago. She, she looks a lot better now. She's, she's in better shape. She's, um, has, is very confident out there. And I, last week they did the Madison rain golden opportunity. And I like that. I think it's, it's different because it's something with the knockouts. Now, when Eli Drake was doing the open challenge, they dropped the ball on that so bad. Oh, my God. And, you know, when at Bound for Glory, we were expecting a really big match. And when we got Ellsworth out there, that damn near checked me out for the rest of the card. Like, I was so pissed about that. I thought they really messed it up. So, last week... Jordan, uh, not Jordan, but Madison Rain took on, uh, God, what was her name? Oh, I, I completely forgot it. Um, I wasn't super impressed with her though. She, she was a, a local gal there. Um, I thought she was talented, but I, I expected a little more athleticism and, um, it was just kind of a normal match, whatever. And this one was a little bit better, but it obviously wasn't versus Madison Rain. I think it's it, it kind of looks like because the Knockouts roster is, I mean, thin, thin as a Bible page. You know, you've got I'm gonna talk about this later as well on an upload. You know, you've got you've got several women who don't even wrestle that are on the, in the Knockouts roster. You know, and you you can't. She wants to be a fighting champion, Jordan Grace, but I mean, there's no one to wrestle. So I think they're transitioning this Madison Rain Golden opportunity to where she's instead of her wrestling, she's going to bring challengers to Jordan Grace, which that I like because the commentary versus during Madison Rain's matches is horrendous, horrendous. This just what I it goes back to what I said earlier. Some people are just not funny, or some things are just not funny. This. Stu Hart shit and hundred time knockouts chance like not funny. Not funny. And it's gotten really old too. It takes away from Madison's matches. And then they have these inside jokes about you'll never get a woman like Madison. And Josh looks like a fool during her matches. Don makes Josh look like a fool. And the bad comment that I'm sorry, the bad comedy that they have in her matches is it's it's so bad. So if this is if we're gonna take the same concept of Madison Rain Golden opportunity, but she's not the one wrestling, <laughs> that's that's music to my ears. But that makes a lot more sense to me, and I can see, you know, her. They're probably using a chance to try out a few knockouts. I can see them doing this up to the pay per view, and you know, her bringing a legitimate challenge challenger for uh, Jordan Grace at the pay per view. Now, one thing I don't really get, though, is, you know, Jordan pretty much offered a knockouts championship match to Madison Rain, and she's like, oh, no, God, no, which is weird because when Taya was a champion, you know, it was, you know, her, Kiera wanted a title match if they helped her, you know what I mean? So that's really weird the way they transition that. I don't understand why she doesn't want a title match. Why does she want to find someone to beat her? I mean, that's kind of strange. This would be a good opportunity, I think. Uh, I, I strongly believe Kelly Klein's going to be a knockout. And uh, she would be a great uh, replacement for, you know, the Tessa Blanchard part of the knockouts division. She would she would, she would, would be a great knockout. And AEW needs her because that division is bad and she would be a great foundational piece for them. But since she's on the outs with the hubby, um, I think impact is the most logical choice for her. And I can see Madison hopefully bringing her out at the pay-per-view and, you know, maybe they're going to drop the ball like they did with Eli Drake and she's, 
<laughs> come at going to come out with ODB or something like that. Uh, that, that would suck. But, uh, so I'm, I'm interested about this going forward and seeing how they're going to do this. But I really think that's where they're going is uh, challenger at the rebellion pay-per-view debuting a new knockout, which they really, 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 really need some knockouts. I'm a big fan of the Susie stuff. It was very quick this week. Um, she's going to have a match next week with Jessica Havoc, no DQ. And this this goes back to how thin the division is because Sue Havoc and Rosemary have had a feud going for what feels like close to a year. It's It's been, I mean, when did Allie leave the company? It, it's been a while. But they freshened it up. And that's what I like. Um, Eddie Edwards took on Michael Elgin. Now, when they when they announced this, everyone knew it was going to go five matches. I mean, that's why I never get excited over best of five series, um, two out of three falls, because they always play out the exact same way. Uh, Iron Man matches, you know, they, they, it just plays out the same way. We all knew that this was going to go five. And I thought doing the Pro Wrestling Revolver match I was pretty disappointed uh, with that. Now, when they when they announced this best of five series, I was interested from the standpoint of a wrestling fan to see good wrestling, good matches. But the promos for it between the two have been uh, Michael Elgin cut a good one this week, but for the most part, they just say the same exact thing every single week, and it gets you know it feels a little bland to me, even though the matches have been great. And I said that I thought the um, at the pay-per-view, Elgin versus Eddie was going to be match of the year. But I think this best of five has completely erased everything they've done. Because now you, you can't even differentiate which match is which with them. You, you just know they've been wrestling a whole effing lot this year. So I think it's, it's going to kind of take them out of the running of doing any, um, you know, having a match of the year candidate. But... I guess what the disconnect for me with this whole thing is from a creative standpoint. Like, what are they fighting for? What, bragging rights? You know, what are they fighting for? They've loosely insinuated that the Call Your Shot Gauntlet trophy is on the line here. But I mean loosely insinuated. And maybe it is on the line, but these are these things that Impact does a really bad job of connecting with the, the audience as far as giving clarity on on certain angles and why they're doing certain things. That has always been a huge weak point with them. So it wouldn't surprise me if on the fifth they're like, okay, you know, the fifth match, they're like, okay, this one's for the trophy. You guys should have known this all along. Uh, is it? I mean, what's going to happen when someone wins? You know, they've both insinuated they're going to challenge Tess at the pay-per-view. So that's why I'm saying, you know, it's very loosely... Uh, insinuated that the the trophy's on the line. I have no clue if it really is, but this match really took a while to get off the ground. They they like to do the strong style stuff, and I'm not a real big fan of that. But it takes a while for the matches to get off the ground, and and, and when you're doing it every match, it's kind of like oh man, like let's 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 get moving, let's let's get going, and they usually kick it into that next gear. But you know they're painting Eddie as some kind of underdog in this whole thing, which is kind of silly in my opinion because I think he is the top baby face under Tessa at the moment. Um, I can't think of anyone else that would be ahead of him in the pecking order, you know? So I don't think painting him and painting Tessa as underdogs is, uh, you know, this, the smartest way to go about that. You know, it's not an upset when they're, they're treating like an upset of Eddie wins, you know, both of his wins have been off roll ups. So uh, I expect this fifth match, though, to be to be crazy. The little segment with Moose and Petey Williams was cool. Uh, Moose is just amazing with everything that he does. And we're going to get Moose versus Petey Williams next week, along with the North versus TJP and Falaba. And Havoc versus Su Young in a no-DQ match. Already talked about that one. But I thought that whole little interview again we got scott demore out there what is his who is he on television what is his role in impact wrestling as far as a television character you know 
they said, uh, PD said, you know, at least those people you listed were champions. Like, Moose is a two-time grand champion. Now, granted, that title's gone. But are we just going to pretend he's never held a title in Impact? Kind of weird, in my opinion. The Johnny Swinger and Willie Mack stuff, uh, I'm glad that they're going to team Disco and Swinger. I mean, not that I have much interest in watching that, but Willie Mack is becoming a rising star right now. And it's funny because Disco pointed out he doesn't have a gimmick because <laughs> he doesn't. And I think that's hurt him a little bit um, on Impact. He's just kind of a dude out there wrestling, putting on good matches. But he's like that rising star right now. He had that big match against the North by himself. And you would just think, okay, Willie, we're going to get behind this dude. He's going to get the Rich Swan push, you know, because Rich was getting up there. Um, and when he comes back, you know, maybe he's above Eddie, whatever. But he was getting that Rich Swan push, and now he's messing with Johnny Swinger. And I think that's that's that really brings him down. I don't really get where they're going with it. We watched the gut check. Um, I'm going to do a separate review of gut check. I'm going to watch the whole thing on impact plus the full episode. And I'm going to review that there. Uh, But I thought it was cool. Um, I guess what I want to say about it really quick though, is that what stood out to me is that these guys all look like professional wrestlers. Uh, And I'm going to go back to, you know, the AC and the Larry D where these are big dudes, you know, and I really expected to see like that, (laughs) you know, for the gut check. And when they did Global Forged, which was not done very well in my opinion, um, we didn't get to know anybody, didn't get to know the participants very well. I only knew Jake and Hakeem because they wrestle locally here all the time, so I already knew who they were. But we didn't really get to know anybody on there. And I I think they're doing a better job with what they showed us, but I'm going to watch the full episode before I can fully say that. But I think they're doing a better job with us connecting with those people and then they should have matches on TV. So, you know, hopefully it's, you know, they drag it out and the people can get behind it because with global forge, we, we weren't behind it because it was just, they just did such a bad job with it, but they're doing a better job job this time around. People have been asking for gut check and it's, it's funny that they bring back gut check right as NWA is doing their, uh, was it called Squared Circle or something like that? I haven't seen the recent NWA episode with that. I'm, I'm behind two weeks on NWA. I'm behind a week on uh, AEW. I was behind a week on Impact, but I, I got caught up there. But I know a, uh, NWA is doing something similar, and it was like, okay, now gut check. <laughs> it happens right around that that same time. So hopefully they're trying to compete with that. And with that being said, hopefully gut check will be done much better. The main event was Tessa Blanchard versus Ace Austin. Uh, we knew that she wasn't going to win X division championship because we would have all known about it already. That's one of those spoilers you can't really avoid, but with Tessa as the champion, they have done a really good job of making her feel fresh. It's very refreshing what they're doing with her because they're keeping Sammy Callahan off television. And for eight months, she was obsessing with OVE and she was wrestling OVE and she was beating OVE. And speaking of OVE, they still can't win a match. They, uh, they lost both their matches on Twitch and impact plus. I I should say both. Dave lost, um, two solo matches, I believe. Or I'm thinking of his match with Rhino. That was on TV. He lost a match by himself. Lost a match with Jake. No. <laughs> I've been watching so much lately. I just know OVE had a queen, clean sweep of losses. Uh, Rhino even beat Madman Fulton. Let me let me not go on my OVE rant right now. Um, I hope that bigger and better things are coming for them in 2020. But to go back to what I was saying, they have kept... Sammy away from this, which I think is good, you know, like we don't want him, you know, if it, if it were WWE, he would have, they would have been fighting the next night, you know, after the pay-per-view and still obsessing with each other. So it's, it's refreshing what they're doing with Tessa. And, you know, Lewis on his podcast was saying that Tessa should be fighting, be a fighting champion, but we were talking on Facebook messenger. And I think what they're doing right now is better because you can't have, you've got a women's world champion and you've got to kind of, creatively 
handle her with kid gloves. I don't think it's a good look for her to just run through the male roster every week. You know, so they've been putting her in tag team matches. She hasn't always won. You know, they lost last week. And before Tessa never lost. In the whole feud with OVE, you know, she lost the two matches to Sammy. And then before Bound for Glory, she lost one tag team match against Sammy and Fulton, I think. And she never lost to OVE any other time. So, you know, now we're seeing her a little more vulnerable as as far as, you know, and on, on the losing end. Uh, with these tag matches and, you know, because she's getting different uh, partners. Uh, I was, I was, <laughs> you already know how I feel about Tommy Dreamer in the main event. I mean, she teamed with Tommy Dreamer and Trey the week before, and, you know, they called it a dream team. Uh, Don Callis called it a dream match. And that's, you know, that's my other rant that I won't, I won't go, go off on right now. This, this dream match shit. Um, but they're doing a good job of making Tessa feel refreshing. And I can't say I watched the match very closely because I was cooking dinner <laughs> at this time. So I was kind of going back and forth with it. But it seemed like the match was pretty good. And then the post angle or the post match angle with Taya coming, uh, I thought was really flat. Uh, she just came and was just delivering punches. You know, there was no road to Valhalla, no running knees. Nothing. She was just hitting her, and she wasn't hitting her very hard either, which usually Taya, uh, I noticed watching her live, she she hits hard. Uh, I noticed it when she was wrestling Allie at the Lucha Underground show, and um, <laughs> she was she was laying into her with these shots, but it was it was like with this, like it wasn't, it almost seemed like the punches weren't connecting, you know, so I thought it was a little bit flat, but they're building up, so they're building up Taya versus Tessa next week for the Impact World Championship. So the first time two women wrestling for the title. I can't say it. I, I know what to think about this, but at the same time, I really want to see it. And this one caught my girlfriend's attention too because she sometimes she'll watch wrestling with me, and she's more likely to watch AEW when I'm watching it. She has, hasn't always been too entertained with impact outside of the Susie stuff. But you know, she commented on my Instagram post like, "Ooh, I'm looking forward to this." Like she she wants to watch this match. So, I think it's it's definitely going to get people's attention. I just don't know if uh, <laughs> I don't know. Impact thinks that bad press is good press, and in most cases that's true. But in Impact's case, it's not. They just need to do everything the right way. And I, they try to do this shock value stuff a little bit. I don't know if it's going to work for them or against them right now. We'll see. But this is interesting. And to just see Taya step away from the knockouts title picture, which goes to, you know, to what I said earlier about Jordan. Like, she has no one to wrestle. So I'm pretty sure she's going to be doing open challenges uh, with Madison. That just makes too much sense. And um, this match, uh, I mean, this episode, I actually I actually watched the flashback. It was Anderson versus um, Hardy. And I thought this was the, I, I really couldn't remember. I thought this was the match where Anderson won the title, um, but it wasn't. They had Anderson on two weeks in a row, losing two weeks in a row. And he's going to be at the TNA <laughs> show. And, you know, I've, I've obviously complained about the flashbacks quite a bit, but it just seemed like, Last week, they were piggybacking off Pope being on NWA. Because we don't ever see Pope otherwise. You know, uh, it is a marketing strategy to feature people who are in the news. You know, when when you have footage on them. But with Impact, I just don't think it's smart the way they do that. Because it, they come off so TNA. And I think they have to avoid that style of marketing the product. You know, to say, oh, here's here's a here's a Pope match. Like Pope beat Anderson. They showed Pope winning, <laughs> and he's in another promotion. And Anderson's going to be on your upcoming show, and then they show the Hardy match, and Anderson loses again. So, I I don't get these guys. Um, but that's going to do it for me in the in the B side. Um, approaching forty minutes here pretty soon, and I that's usually about where I cut the podcast off. So thank you for listening. Uh, there's going to be more podcasts coming. 
uh, from myself and from others. And I will be bringing the original content back soon to YouTube, at the Impact Lounge. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for listening. This is your boy BQ, and I'm out.